All right. So today, I'm going to talk about the solutions to the Great Depression by Franklin Roosevelt and his administration, which we often refer to as the New Deal. So today, when focusing on the New Deal, I'll be focusing on years 1933 to 1937. This is not the entire administration of FDR as we understand that he goes on to face World War II. And this New Deal policy era does come to an end. Some of that I will save for another day. So today, let's talk about what the New Deal was about and give examples of New Deal agencies. Now this slide is being dealt with in class already. I just want everybody to remember that Franklin Roosevelt was not just elected to be the president as much as he was elected to solve a great problem. He was, saw, he was elected to be a change agent. I mean, we got to almost put the hopes and dreams and savior status on this man. So for that, good luck, right? Now, when we talk about the New Deal, we will be talking about his campaign slogan, the mantra, New Deal for the Common Man, the idea that the government will lead relief, recovery, and reform, the three R's. You'll see a lot of FDR's policies will be counter the concept of rugged individualism, counter the idea that prosperity is coming will be fine. It's more about the government will help prosperity come and the government will help us be fine. So these are some slides that we'll deal with in class. I'm just clicking through for those who might have missed. So let's get into it. There's FDR. FDR um, coming into the administration, had always surrounded himself with the best and the brightest. Even meeting with Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover will go on to actually call FDR a political lightweight, not thinking that FDR had the intellectual capabilities and leadership capabilities to solve the great problems of the day. So Herbert Hoover, who already struggled in office, is coming down on FDR. We'll see how things work out. So what did FDR want? So what was his goal in all of this? Well, obviously a better America. But follow me. FDR wanted in the following order. Number one, he wanted social reform. Think about it. When he stops the New Deal, when he stops his administration, he wants a new world order. I'm not trying to say he wants kind of like an animal farm revolution, you know, for those who, of course, read the book, it's, it's like he doesn't want to leave his office with the status quo. Now, to obtain this social reform, he's going to use the Great Depression to obtain his goals. For example, the way to get social reform is to create a new political order dominated by the Democratic Party, dominated by the liberals of America, the intellectuals, the um, uh, not necessarily businessmen, but the educated elite. So in essence, he wants social reform and political realignment. Number three, he wants economic recovery. But just listen, I'm going to condemn him because you think he should have economic recovery first, right? That should be the first thing he wants. But think about it. Just follow his logic. Why fix the economy immediately if you're only going to fall back into the same problems in the future? We need to have a new world order. Now, people will condemn him for this, calling him as much as a socialist, being more in tune to politics than he is into actually helping the common man. But I wanted you to understand a little bit about his background. Now, is he going to have success? OMG, follow this. He's dealing with Democrats and Republicans who have a history of cutting spending, having stiff, firm taxes, and always valuing a balanced budget. I mean, Herbert Hoover is an example. Herbert Hoover, um, when spending a lot of money, felt he needed to raise some taxes to balance a budget. 
because uh, Herbert Hoover and many conservatives, but also Democrats as well, they want to keep taxes low. They want to keep spending low. They don't want the government to go into debt. So FDR has to make a decision. When is it good to go into debt? When is it good to spend more money than you can feasibly make? Now, in his politics, I will compliment him that he knows how to play the game. Uh, bringing Harold Ickes and Henry Wallace as Republicans into his own cabinet. Now, don't forget, the Republicans that he was bringing into his cabinet were the progressive type of Republicans that had been going through the change since the TR era. So I know we're going to call them Republicans, but they're not Republicans in the conservative 20 cents. They're Republicans in the progressive era sense. So these are just some of the politics behind the New Deal. Bring America together, challenge the Congress to follow him, to get social and political realignment, and of course, let's fix this economy. So the New Deal has its origins from his campaign promise. It's going to be led by the Brains Trust. These are a group of advisors slash experts from the academic world, given permission to experiment. Now, I'm going to compliment it because these were people that were willing to throw darts at the dartboard and given permission to miss the target. At least try and shoot. All right? Does that all make sense? But I'm going to criticize this because many of his ex Experts, his advisors, were not from the business world. They were from academia. So sometimes you need businessmen leading business changes and choices, all right? So there's ways to criticize and compliment the brain's trust. Now, don't forget, he wants three things, the three R's. He wants to get assistance and temporary income. We call that relief. He wants people to have some sort of job, even if it's a cruddy job, some sort of aid, even if it's cruddy aid, to get through the immediate horrors of poverty. He then wants to, well, get out of the depression, fix the economy in the short run, hire people in better paying jobs, industrial and agricultural jobs. And I'm going to say, most importantly, he wants reform. He wants to make sure our economy never does this again. Now, here's my opinion. In relief, he does what he has to do, and in many ways, he considers, he continues Hoover's policies. His recovery, I think, is his biggest failure between policies of his being struck as unconstitutional to also the fact that the economy doesn't actually seem to recover until World War II. But in the long run, and this is my opinion, though I think I'm supported, in the long run, his reform leaves the greatest lasting impact on the United States and its economy. Even today, President Bush and President Obama used his policies when dealing with the great um, recession that started in 19, uh, 2008. All right. So all of this culminates in the first 100 days in office. In his first 100 days, he passes 15 major pieces of legislation. He has a lot of popular support in America. He's got congressional support in the short term. People were willing to push change. Now follow. Some of these laws that were pushed were strong-armed through Congress using the bully pulpit of the president's seat to get what he wanted. I mean, there is absolutely stories of congressmen not reading, on, reading laws that they just voted for. Okay, so let's go through some uh, political cartoons that I think make a lot of sense here. Up here we have FDR. He says something, holding a bag as New Deal remedies, so he seems like a doctor visiting. Over here we see Congress bowing their head uh, coming across, we start seeing the pajamas, we look up, this looks like Uncle Sam, all right? Uncle Sam, though, wearing pajamas or a robe, he seems sort of sickly, he's getting visited by a doctor. This doctor is bringing a bunch of medicines. These medicines have uh, the alphabet agencies on them, and one specifically, the NRA, stands out. So this political cartoon shows that here we are, 
The government is trying to fix the American Great Depression. Obviously, some of the medicines are not working, so they're trying other medicines. Congress is deferring to this, and of course, we may have to change remedies if we don't get results. We have to understand this is a major change factor in America. The fact that we have a president willing to try, to experiment. This is the opposite of the status quo. This is opposite of a, a rugged individualism and traditionalism. This is not only going backwards from the 1920s policies, this is taking progressivism and putting it to the extreme. This is the same type of cartoon, all right? We have a bunch of New Deal ideas being thrown at Uncle Sam. FDR saying, hey, you wanted action? Well, I'll give you action. He's just throwing them at. You could even see Uncle Sam, the United States government's like falling backwards from almost being overwhelmed by this. You have to choose if these cartoons are for or against the New Deal. Now, there were two New Deals. In this course, though, I do not necessarily treat them uh, differently. So in the first New Deal, they wanted to gain control of prices and wages. This is to get out of uh, economic horrors. He did this by using his cult of personality. Um, the banks were closed for a few days, stock market was closed for a few days, and he took to the radio. And we'll listen to that stuff in class. Now, a couple years later, when the first New Deal didn't quote-unquote fix everything, he starts appealing to the base, looking at long-term solutions to the short-term Great Depression. This appeals greatly to the Democratic liberal base. So maybe in the first New Deal, he's dealing with relief and recovery, but definitely during the second New Deal, which is just two years later, he's dealing more with long-term solutions. Down here is just a, a link uh, that kind of gives you a chronology of them. Now, in my lesson, I'm going to talk about not the first and the second New Deal, rather the New Deal in terms of relief, recovery, and reform. So here is just some examples of New Deal alphabet agencies. FARA, the Federal Emergency Relief Agency, was created to distribute federal money to state and local agencies. Then these agencies would provide direct aid. A great example of that is federal money going to Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania giving some of that money to the YMCA. The YMCA then can feed and clothe and even house people of need. So what is happening here is direct relief, direct aid through state and local agencies. Federal dollars being spent at the local level. The CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Sorry. I love this one. It's a great story. So the Civilian Conservation Corps was to take young men we're going to say late teens, early 20s, ship them from Chicago and New York City and ship them out west. Look at the visuals. Out west is kind of like a, a, a no man's land in America. It's not fully developed. And these young men can be paid to clear forests, build roads and bridges. Now, the CCC was great because it was getting paid by federal dollars, but also getting things done for America. You know, building a dam, building a road or a bridge where there wasn't one. People lived in tents, sometimes for weeks, months, or years. Now, they were segregated, but they did allow African Americans also to participate in it. But I do want to say something on the, on the, on the fly as well. The CCC also served another purpose. Get young men away from the cities. Just imagine you're 19, you had dropped out of high school, you did not have a lot of economic job potential. 
we don't want you to be homeless in Chicago. We don't want you leading a life of crime in Chicago. So get you away from Chicago. Trying to make the cities a safer place by removing pops possible hazards. I like that one, by the way. Shady. The PWA. Now, the PWA, you can see by the visual, created jobs in local areas such as street maintenances, building repair. The PWA was trying to keep up uh, local institutions, uh, make sure that the parks are nice, make sure that the water is flowing, make sure buildings are renovated. These PWA jobs typically weren't amazing jobs, but it's better to be a street cleaner than to be unemployed. The WPA, and by the way, this is me, and this is me back in, uh, I'd probably say 2002, 2003. And that's because of what's in my room. See, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, was similar to the PWA, but it, it reached out of the community. For example, it tried to help people with certain skills. The WPA paid the Federal Writers Project. It paid people with uh, maybe college degrees in journalism to go interview former slaves who by this point would have been 60, 70, 80 years old. These interviews from the Federal Writers Project are now of the Library of Congress. Then you have the FAP, the Federal Artist Project, that painted the murals that you have all seen in my room. These murals were paid with FAP dollars to try and, you know, hire local artisans to make America beautiful, pay them some money, kind of keep up the idea of hope and change. There's also the FTP, the Federal Theater Project, which would put um, shows on in parks in Chicago and New York City. So now people are watching Shakespearean theater during a Great Depression in the middle of a park. A lot of us would say, well, that's kind of a waste of money, but those people are getting paid, which means they're getting fed. It also means people have something to get their mind off of the 25, 30% unemployment rate in certain areas. Now, that's relief. These were ways to get people some jobs, some money to get through the day. Now, let's take a look at recovery. Remembering, recovery was about getting people uh, out of the Great Depression. The NIRA was uh, created, National Industrial Recovery Act, which created the National Recovery Administration, shown here, the NRA, was created to help set industrial codes such as wages and prices. Now, it was declared unconstitutional. We are going to look at the NRA in much more detail in class. The AAA um, was now where this was for urban, this is for rural, paid government, uh, the government paid farmers to decrease their surplus, literally killing the pigs to make pork more expensive. It will also be declared unconstitutional. We're going to look at the AAA a lot more in detail in class. In short, the NIRA and the AAA are the backbone of FDR's recovery plan. They are struck down as unconstitutional, and we need to understand all of that. Then there's another recovery institution called the TVA, which is still around today, the Tennessee Valley Authority. My dad actually worked for the TVA for a short time. It was a government-built and run electricity company right here. The idea of the TVA was if we build the dams in this area, people will have jobs. We will also produce hydroelectric power, which will help advanced, civilized, technologically revolutionize this entire backwater land. Now, there is a problem to this. You know, this is something that's typically done by private businesses, but the TVA was a government-run monopoly. So instead of private businesses making millions on the money, this is the government doing the job. But as much as it's a government-run monopoly, it also provided jobs. 
and provided necessary electricity and to a degree is still around today. Now, the TVA here was the hydroelectric damming thing. There's also the REA, and the Rural Electrification Act was government effort to bring electricity to the sticks. Right up here, you see that? This was not a government-run monopoly. This was the government trying to make sure electricity got to the, the back hills of Texas. I always use the best example is um, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who lived in Texas. Grew up going to an outhouse for a bathroom and did not have electricity. And when electricity is brought to his house in Texas via the REA, this really solidifies him as a, a, a future lifelong Democrat, a liberal. The idea that one day there is no, and then the next day there is, electricity in your house is pretty powerful. Now, lastly, and we are going to deal with some of these in class because of their long-term significance. We have reform. <laughs> you like that picture? Uh, FDR, one of the first things he does in office is he repeals the 18th Amendment by pushing forth the 21st Amendment. The Prohibition era is over. It lasted 13 years as a great social experiment. But in the long run, the government would not mind putting Yingling back to work and then taxing their profits. It's all about jobs and taxes. The SEC is still around today. If your parents or you own any sort of stock, you know, shares in a corporation, they are monitored by the SEC to make sure that those securities or stocks and when they're exchanged uh, is all done on the up and up. So the SEC, they ask for Apple to file their profits. Those filings with the SEC are then made public and to shareholders. So if you want to put money into Apple, you want to put money into, you know, Pearson books, then you flat out know how well Apple's doing as a corporation. There's no lying, no fibbing. This really was built to go fix the speculation of the 1920s. The Emergency Banking Act is what created the bank holiday for a few days based off of this idea that all we have to fear is fear itself. FDR got on the radio and basically said, I am closing the banks. When the banks are open, they are open with government permission. So imagine, the banks are all closed, no more running to get your money out of the bank. The government tells you via a fireside chat, that if your bank down the street opens up, it's been given permission to open up. It's been checked. It's been monitored. Please trust that bank. It will not lose your money. And finally, for the first time in four years, if you will, deposits exceed withdrawals. The Glass-Steagall Banking Act ends the United States' gold standard. Thus, the United States can create inflationary policies. It also created the FDIC. The Glass-Steagall back creating the FDIC finally also stopped banks from investing someone's savings in the stock market. The Glass-Steagall Banking Act tried to make sure that your money was more protected and less risk was being taken. Now let's go into the FDIC a little bit more. The FDIC is the government's backing or insurance of certain banks. For example, the FDIC is insuring my money in my bank as, la as long as I have less than $250,000. And I do have less than $250,000. The idea is that when the government says it has my back, then I'll be more likely to put money in the bank. If you put money in the bank, then the bank has money to lend, lend, lend. The economy can continue. 
Now, we're going to study the uh, SSA, the Social Security Act, more in class. But just understand, this is a social safety net. It's this idea that there are groups such as the elderly, the orphaned, and the disabled who get government money, government checks, government aid, because we, what else are they going to do? We can't have physically disabled people on the streets, homeless, because they can't physically work. We can't have 80-year-old people on the streets because they physically can't work. So the government will fly in and using younger generations' money to pay for the older generations will protect grandma, the orphaned, and the disabled. You'll see I'm flying through these, and that's because, well, we're close to 26 minutes. I think it's fair that I talk more about HOLC, FHA, and the Wagner Act, which created the National Labor Relations Board in class. So what I did today is I introduced, and for some of these went over in, in detail, a bunch of New Deal agencies. A lot of them are known by their acronyms, and I would encourage you to start learning those acronyms now. And then what we're going to do is try to put them together to see what worked, what was a risk, what failed, and how it's changed the United States and its dealings with the economy today. Have a good one.